um, to give you a little bit of information about Ron, and then we'll kick it off here. Um, throughout his career as a pastor, a counselor, and a professor, Ron has had a keen interest in the impact of relinquishment upon children who become adopted. What is it like to lose first parents? Has been the guiding force, the guiding focus of his work for nearly 30 years. Ron studied at the University of Denver, where his PhD dissertation was on hope and fantasy in the lives of relinquished and adopted adults, um, which was at the time a never before asked inquiry into the um, birth parent fantasies that adult adoptees live as they're, um, as they're growing up in historically the closed adoption system. Ron has been a speaker at many adoption conferences. That's where I've met him. Um, and uh, he has spent much of his career first in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, now he's back in Colorado and he is presently on the staff of PCD Counseling in Denver, Colorado, where his primary focus is offering therapy to adoption triad members. Uh, Ron's books, um, which include Adoptees Coming of Age and Wise Adoptive Parenting can be found, links to the books can be found on our website. And with that, we will give you Ron. Thank you. Okay, I'm ready to go. Um, can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay, because I can't see me here. That's fine okay. with me. You're, we can see you. All right, let me, uh, let me spend some time in a, what to me is a very important conversation about how relinquishment has significant impacts on the way in which um, sometimes relinquished and adopted people uh, form their love lives. So it, I, at one point I called it adoptee romantic radar and that kind of captures the idea that I'm after. Um, as a preliminary to um, the conversation about love lives, I'd like to lay out a few pieces of the puzzle that I think are really important. Um, the first thing that I'd like to make comment about is how important it is to separate relinquishment from adoption. Um, it, it, it tends to be the case that we hear about adopted, adopted, adopted all the time. And we don't say relinquished and adopted. And you'll always hear me using both words, even though it's a mouthful to describe um, a story, a pers personal story. Uh, relinquishment and adoption are not simply, that's the first thing is that we need to separate them. And they're not to be thought of simply as legal moments in time. Relinquishment does in fact occur legally at a certain point and adoption may occur legally at another certain point. But um, I think about them as lifelong kind of parallel processes in the lives of adoptees that parallel each other and that relinquishment in one way or another often impacts the capacity for adoption. Now remember again, adoption has to do with the um, relationship that an adoptee has with his or her adoptive parents. And um, I think that quite unfairly, adoptive parents really take a hit when it looks like the problems that they're having with their children are directly related, first of all, to adoption. And I parse that out and say, let's take a look, first of all, at relinquishment. And the way I would say it simply is, a lot of times we hear people say, well, adopted kids have problems. And I always wince a little when I hear it um, because I'd rather hear somebody say relinquished children have problems. And then I would say, well, of course there's a problem because we're tampering with the most important relationship on earth between a mother and that mother's child. So I separate them out. And then I notice that relinquishment sets in place a bit of a catch-22 for adoptive development. Adoption is the relationship that one would have with adoptive parents. Well, if relinquishment is an injury of some sort, what Nancy Verrier calls a primal wound, if relinquishment has some emotional pain and distress connected to it, and imagine an infant feeling unsafe, that's where you would begin to sense some of the, the complications that may occur. Um, even at birth, even prenatally, there's a bonding that does occur. And if that bonding is broken, we don't know 
how that affects a child, but we're saying it's not nothing. And what I'm often saying is you can't fix a problem if you don't see it, if you don't say that it's there. So I'm asking us to wonder what, what impact does relinquishment have on adoption in general? And then I noticed that there's a catch-22 in adoptive development. And that catch-22 goes this way. If there's an injury of some sort with regard to this primal wound of relinquishment, however that occurs, or termination of rights um, in the courtroom, however that occurs, it may make it more difficult to allow the attachment that um, adoptive parents may want to offer. I've done a lot of work with adoptive parents who are so distressed because they can't quite find a way to the heart of their child. The second book that I wrote, Wise Adoptive Parenting, kind of gets at that when there's real difficulties in that adoptive relationship. So all I'm saying so far is relinquishment impacts, relinquishment can have a catch-22 um, dilemma for adoptees because they may be compromised in their capacity to trust. In order to feel safe and secure, even as an infant, you have to trust that place in a mother's neck where that baby can bond and connect. And that's so very, very important for the development of the child. So let's wonder about how relinquishment impacts adoption. And I'll just, just notice it and say, well, now we're gonna move into a bit of a, a different question. How does relinquishment that may certainly impact adoptive development, how does relinquishment also inform and impact the way in which um, adoptees may construct um, intimacy in their lives? And that brings us to the, to the issue of the day with regard to um, adoptive develop, I mean, I've said it wrong, uh, adoptive romantic radar kind of question. So let me tell a story a couple of stories and then make a few comments and then invite your, your questions. This story, um, and I'm using it on purpose to make the point, this story has nothing to do with adoption, relinquishment and adoption, but it's a true story that has stayed with me. Um, imagine with me um, a co-ed at the University of Colorado up in Boulder and um, just notice with me for a moment, we're going to call her Brooke. And Brooke's father and mother are going through a divorce. And um, what happens is that because of the anger of the father, he refuses to pay tuition for his daughter. And so he has, she has learned that after this semester, she's going to have to uh, drop out of school because dad is so angry with mom that dad's not gonna cover the tuition. Well, two guys are walking down the sidewalk and I want you to imagine this with me. One of them would be a person who um, is very affectionate and responsive to her and would give her flowers and, um, and, and, and whisper wonderful things to her. And um, the other guy is a guy who just kind of quietly ignores her and doesn't take much interest in her. And both of them are attractive men. Which one would that would, would Brooke be attracted to? And we would all want her to be attracted to a man who would treat her well, who would uh, share that affection in a very caring way. But in the story that unfolded, this is a true story, she was quite attracted to the guy who saw no interest in her. She found herself quite attracted to the guy who would not treat her well. And I want you to see that that's kind of a, uh, a cloud over her romantic, or yeah, her romantic radar where she's looking for a relationship with a man that will treat her poorly. Now, what a sad thing to say, but it's often the case that this is exactly what happens. And in Brooke's case, she did find herself quite attracted to the man who, the, to the, the uh, college student who would treat her poorly. Well, why would she be doing that? And that brings us to kind of a theory that um, 
there's all kinds of names for it, but the theory is basically that in our romantic developments, however they play out, um, in those relationships, we usually are finding ourselves attracted to someone who is, who is as closest to the parent that we're having the most trouble with. And in this case, Brooke was certainly hurt by her father who refused to pay his tu the tuition and um, kind of felt really betrayed by that father. And now she's finding herself attracted to men who will treat her poorly. What a, what a tragedy I've just described to you. Now take that theory and that theory briefly simply says that in our romantic relationships, we tend to, re, to attempt to work out the problems that we, the baggage that we bring, bring to the relationship in the first place. Here's another story that we'll get at um, the adoptive romantic dilemma in some detail. Again, it's a true story. It happens to be at the beginning of the first book, Adoptees Come of Age, but let me just lay it out for you quite briefly. Um, a couple came to me for marriage counseling and they came for marriage counseling because the, um, the wife had gotten so angry with her husband that she threw the Rolodex at him and put a dent in the drywall at the office of the real estate company where he was working. So all this anger at her husband because her husband had, um, had spent so much time with a younger secretary that um, he had taken, he had really become attracted to and spending time with her and taking, with, taking her along to, a, to um, a, evaluate real estate, whatever it might be. But finally, the wife of this man had had it uh, with all this. And so she came into the office, the Rolodex hit the drywall, and that was the ticket for marriage counseling. In the intake conversations, and this is early in my own uh, learning, I want you to see kind of like I had a learning curve myself to get this. In the intake, I had asked about um, early on development and uh, the husband volunteered right away and said, hey, I, I, I have great adoptive parents. I know they love me. Um, and I don't have a problem with being adopted. That's how he said it. And I want you to know that I went along with that and said, well, that must be exactly the truth about this man. In the supervision that I received, after several months of not being very helpful at all, my supervisor said, you know, you need to go back and ask a little bit more about that adoption story. And so I did, and I brought, I brought that question up and I asked him, if he would bring in his adoption papers because he knew where they were. He hadn't looked at them for many, many years, but he brought them in. And um, I remember very specifically taking the paper and looking at it and the, the document from the state of Montana explaining his adoption. But then behind it was a description of his birth mother. Now, what I should have told you earlier was that the, the, um, the, the secretary that he had been taken by, so in, interested in, was 29 years old and she had brown hair and blue eyes. I took the piece of paper behind the document and I looked at it and I said to this man, you know, according to this document, your birth mother was 29 years old and she had brown hair, blue eyes. And I said, what do you think of that in relationship to the secretary that's getting you in trouble? And at that point, the man finally became aware of the pain that he had carried for 41 years. And he said with great, great distress, with tears in his eyes, he said, well, why, why didn't she love me? He had carried that sorrow all these years. And in his relationship with his wife, he had basically re, uh, re replaced a very good adoptive mother who cared for him deeply. And this wife was very much like her. 
And now at, you know, at 10, maybe 15 years into the marriage, all of a sudden this whole thing breaks loose. And he begins to help me understand how much grief he was in. And he begins to help me understand how important it was for him to attend to the sorrow that he carried all those years. Now in this specific story, relinquishment did not set up the marriage. Relinquishment set up the affair that he was having with his secretary. When he was able to do the heavy lifting of his own therapy, what happened? Well, search and reunion, um, children's aid and home, ch children's aid society in a, in a, in a city, uh, I think it was Chicago. The long and short of it is that he reunited with her and he found out that he had four siblings and that they, um, they were all um, interested in who he was and what, what the relationship might be. And what I remember about the conversation at the end of it was that he reunited with his full brothers and his full brothers by birth. And they went up the coast, the East Coast, and they all rented Corvettes and all of them spent a week together. It's a happy ending to a painful story. What I'm saying about adoptee romantic radar is that we in our relationships in one way or another will work out the, um, the baggage that we bring to the relationship, whatever that might be. And as all of us really know, um, when we fall in love, because that's what we're talking about, when we fall in love, everything's okay. When we fall in love, there's a sense of, of I've known you all my life. There's a sense of deep connection. And in that falling in love, we basically believe that our problems have been solved, only to learn down the road that we always bring ourselves with us in these relationships. And so sometimes, sometimes adoptees find themselves caught in the middle of the dilemma of what has happened to me in this relationship. I'd like to read a quote that helps us understand the theory, and then I'll apply it to the adoptive relinquishment and adoptive story. Here's the quote. The unconscious mind um, directs people to choose partners, partners who have the potential for bringing them face to face with some of their central life fears so that these fears can be worked through and this time come out better. People recreate in marriage their central life dilemma for themselves in order to work it through and this time to come out better. And then this sentence, which captures what's under, often which, under, which is underneath painful divorce. In this process, only the person we really love and who touches our very roots has the capacity to drive us crazy as well as to help us find our deepest strengths. Put differently, the way that we arrange our romantic relationships in one way or another has an immense amount to do with the work, the heavy lifting that we sometimes still have to do in order to have a healthy relationship. In the story that I told, the marriage itself was really not the problem. In the story that I told, the relationship with that 29 year old secretary was indeed the problem. And it bubbled up after years and years of staying outside of his awareness. What happens in our relationships is that sooner or later, if we need to, we will distort our mates. Now, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of literature about communication when it comes to marital therapy. Um, there's a lot of conversation about how important communication is. What I say about communication is that communication is really important because it prevents silence. One of the purposes of communication is to prevent silence. What do I mean? I mean that in silence, and this has been uh, my experience learning this over the years, uh, working with many different kinds of marriages, in silence, we are able to distort the person that we are with in such a way 
that that person becomes our enemy. To whatever degree that distortion occurs, then the mate that we were once falling in love with becomes the enemy that we have to deal with, the person that we have to struggle with. And I think that that distortion is often unnoticed and it's not written about very much, but it has to do with the need that we have to make somebody into the problem that we have not finished addressing. So what I'm saying with regard to relinquishment and adoption kind of plays out this way. To whatever degree, we have not been able to grieve the injury, the, 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 the primal wound that um, adoptees are faced with, to whatever degree we need to, we might put that on the side, sooner or later, it will find its way into our relationship in such a way that we will begin to distort. And in the process of distorting, we will, we will be working at trying to come to terms with an injury that has never been fully realized or forgiven, realized or forgiven. And so that distortion, when that happens, um, sets things in place, sets things in place in such a way that at some point there's going to be a break in the relationship, which may be quite unfair to uh, the partner of the adoptee. Now, one of the um, one of the things that I'd like to just say, excuse me, just a second. I'm getting a piece of paper. One of the things I'd like to um, give examples to is this: if, in fact, our greatest concern is to work out a dilemma that we bring to the relationship, if that's our greatest concern and we distort enough to make that person become the person that we are in distress with, then it's at that point that sometimes things really fall apart. And that's when marital therapy becomes um, kind of the, a, a, a real necessity. In those relationships, sometimes people will um, create a, a compromised attachment to a given mate because that compromised attachment um, I'm, I'm not saying it very well. That compromised attachment disallows too much closeness because there's a, dis, there's a distress in the relationship itself. Sometimes adoptees may marry someone who they are able to um, really control. And so they can be assured that they'll never be relinquished again. Other times, adoptees may marry somebody who controls them and the price for the being controlled is the security that you have if you know that someone will never leave you. So you can respond in different ways in a marital relationship, but if dealing with relinquishment is the guiding principle or the guiding point around which people struggle, if that's in fact the case, then those relationships will be very prone to a certain kind of distortion and the kind of the puzzle of why is it that you've needed to create the enemy that, um, that your mate has become. And what I'm saying then is this, that with regard to um, romantic attraction adoptee style, unless the primal injury is in some ways noticed and managed and I think forgiven, unless that's the case, if that's still an issue in the heart of a person, then that, that dilemma is gonna play itself out in romantic relationships. Um, remember what I said about Brooke, who, who, uh, whose dad wouldn't pay her tuition anymore. Um, part, of, part of her broken heart because of how her dad treated her so poorly, really set her up to be attracted to other men, to, to, to different guys who would treat her poorly because she had not at all finished the, the great dilemma that she had with the father who had treated her so poorly. That kind of dynamic, when that dynamic gets going in a relationship, 
unless it is um, unless it is noticed that the relinquishment itself is an injury that has never been attended to, if that's the case, then one way or another that will play itself out in ro in a romantic relationship. And you know, it's so sad when that kind of distortion occurs and the uh, breakdown of the relationship happens because of the unfinished business, the unfinished homework that someone may have. Um, so maybe that's enough for me to um, open up the question uh, for you in terms of responding to how do we think about getting beyond that dilemma and coping with it in such a way that we can restore or preserve or restore uh, our, our romantic relationships. So I think Betsy, that's enough for me in terms of the uh, concern I have. And let's see if we can have a dialogue here. Okay, before we jump into the questions, Ron, um, you had a quote a few minutes ago that you read, and we had a question of who that who you were quoting. Uh, the quote actually came from a PhD named David Worster, W-U-R-S-T-E-R. -E and it's in a um, an article entitled Marriage Crucible for Growth. Okay? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we will start with uh, the questions that were submitted ahead of time. And then if anybody who's here this evening has additional questions, feel free to put them in chat. Um, so the first question that was submitted was, uh, do you think that two aware adoptees would be able to find love together? All right, everybody's heard the question. I love the question. I um, mean, and, and the real question, the real question around the question has to do with the word aware. Of course they can find love. And of course they will, I mean, what, what starts, what may start out of love in such a story is what we call identification. I understand you because I've had an experience like you've had an experience. But I would be very careful to say that the experience of each person is unique. And we may identify and we may both be aware that we are relinquished and adopted people, but that, that identification has limitations. And aware needs to mean that the adoptee who is so-called aware is able to say, hi, this is my name. This is what happened to me. This is my story. I know my truth and I'm able to uh, put it in words and express it. And I'm able to forgive the injury that I sustained. So that's kind of like um, the homework that has to happen. And if two relinquished and adopted people both do their heavy lifting, of course they can have a great relationship. And the identification will be helpful to them in terms of um, putting a foundation under their relationship. But I will say again, each story is unique. So my answer to the simple question is yes. Thank <laughs> you. Right. Um, okay, second question that was submitted. Um, that uh, this person suspects that any um, loss, such as an early death of a parent, would influence um, the choice of a mate in a similar way. So comparing and contrasting maybe adoption with other early losses. The first uh, comment I would make about the early loss comparison, I guess I'd call it a comparison. Um, the first comment I would make is, I'm so uncomfortable with the comparison itself about um, parent loss in early life. Like even if you have a, a story of a child or a person who loses a, a, a mom or a dad very, very early on, there's still the reality for, if it's a mom, it's still, there's still the reality of prenatal attachment, what we call bonding and attachment for children. Um, and the, so the, the, the circumstances around relinquishment and adoption are unique. And we have been tampering with that. I mean, adoption relinquishment is tampering in 
with that relationship and breaking it up. If there is prenatal bonding and there is an injury of some sort, the primal wound that we all reference, then that has to be noticed as a rather unique developmental challenge. And it's not simply like I lost my mom to cancer or I lost my dad in a car accident when I was very little. Even in that story, there, the dynamics of relinquishment are not in place. And if the dynamics of relinquishment are not in place, that sets up a very unique challenge for adoptees that um, and that that the comparison the comparison fails because an adoptee has to face this reality that even though there may have been very good reasons when I was born I was not kept and that is by itself profoundly painful when I was born I was not kept if my birth mother birth father too let's not exclude them. If they loved me more, they would have done more to keep me. Now, you know the history of all this. I don't need to say much about it. Um, uh, Ann Kessler's book that's coming, that, that you'll, you'll be uh, dealing with in, in June, I think she's coming on board for you. There's a lot of reasons why those relinquishments happened. And the 50 year ago relinquishments, um, 1960s and 70s, um, it was still the case that the price for um, un, unplanned pregnancy in teenagers, the price uh, for that, so that, 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 that moral slip, whatever, was the punishment was you had to give up your baby. And so many birth mothers, I mean, I want to be really kind to the birth mothers who, for, birth mothers never get over this. They never get over this. Healthy birth mothers grieve for the rest of their lives. That's just the truth. And that's because a part of them has, 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 has been lost. Um, so my comment about, um, excuse me, my, my comment about the, the comparison is that I'm really uncomfortable with comparisons and that the dynamics around relinquishment are so unique that to make that comparison is to really minimize um, the reality and the uniqueness of what adoptees have to face in their development. So, you know, what I'm saying, and I made, make this comment in the first book, adoptees can grow up well, but they grow up differently. And they have different developmental challenges than people who are simply by birth and grow up with a family uh, to, into which they were born. So enough of that, but the comparison, um, minimizes in a way that I'm not comfortable with. Thank you. Um, the third question that was submitted ahead of time is, um, what are some of the main reasons why sometimes reunions between adoptees and their birth or first parents or family members don't last or don't work out? I'm working uh, right now with the person who had a two year reunion that ended six years ago. There are so many possible answers to the question of why reunions may not last, but in a, a kind of a generalizing way, if the, if the dynamics around relinquishment and adoption are not really thoroughly named and grieved, grieved and forgiven, if that does not happen, then th this, uh, this reunion thing, this re reunion experience may not have enough strength or enough, yeah, enough strength for, uh, for the, the, the reunited people, birth mother and, and, and adoptee, there may not be enough strength to sustain if those issues are still underneath. If underneath the conversation or underneath the relationship, there is an unresolved conflict, then I think that um, reunions may in fact kind of run out of gas, that's possible. In the, in the case that I'm mentioning right now, this was so interesting to me. The, um, the birth mother and the reunion was for two years, but then the adoptive mother's jealousy, and jealousy means I wanna keep what's mine. 
the adoptive mother's jealousy, the birth mother sensed it. And so when the birth mother sensed that that expression of jealousy on the part of um, the adoptive mom, that birth mother withdrew. So that's a unique example of one of the many possible dynamics that, um, that may bring a reunion to an end. Um, if, if it's initially a, a very brief reunion and, and then it falls apart, um, then I would say that it's just too painful. For, when it's just too painful for people to know, when it's too painful for people to know, all of us, we will back away. And so there are, I'm sure are times when in a reunion, the issues bubble up, but they are not carefully respected and managed and in my, word, my language grieved. If that doesn't happen, then that re reunion may not have the strength to last. But that's um, only the beginning of a response to that question because there are so many different variables that come to play. Um, I'm also working in, in another, another story, and this is a story of a 35-year-old adoptee, and he, he, found his, he found his birth mother in five minutes. That's how long it took him on the computer to find her. She's in Texas, and um, he is really struggling with this reunion because he's ashamed of himself. And I'm so, I grieve this because the shame gets in the way of his own development. Um, he has never held himself together very well. And um, he has a certain sense of shame. And so he's, he's kind of staying away from her. She's waiting for more and he's staying away from her. In a general way, what I'm saying is whenever there's an unresolved dilemma, unless it's attended to empathically, then that has develops the power to break up or break up a relationship. So those are a couple examples. Thank you. Um, so typically people put their questions in chat, but I think we have one quite one person who wanted to pose her question directly for some reason. So Dee, did you want to do that? Uh, yes, I wanted to just comment on a lot of things you said. Um, and can I just give my background a little bit? Sure, briefly. Okay, so I'm a late discovery adoptee. Um, I found out at age 23, and now I'm 53, and the birth father I thought was my birth father who had died earlier, I found out through 23andMe that he's alive. Mm -hmm. And so I just met him over the phone like last week. <laughs> um, so, you know, I really feel like, um, you know, it's really, it's really going to help me with relationships with men because for years I just struggled with um, not knowing that side of me, that, that biological father. So even though I had a wonderful adoptive father, but I wanted to just comment about um, attachment theory. And one of the things I struggled with was just wanting to attach to someone too early in a relationship and that sense of belonging and that sense of placement. And then also um, looking at patterns, you know, like being mindful of the types of people you attract and shifting those paradigms. May I respond? Yes. Thank you for, thank you for your vulnerability and your, your ability and your willingness to, to tell us your story a little bit. You know, when you're at age 23 and you learn that something fraudulent has happened. Um, the injury there must be, must be very, very difficult to, to kind of to, to sustain and come to terms with. Um, I'm wondering if you ever had a sense prior to that about this. So that's something I would wonder about. But the comment that I'm making is at, is, is at 23, you learn that. I wonder if there was a shift for you at that time in terms of how you saw your relationships with men. There was a shift. I mean, I struggled with the nature versus the nurture. 
you know, right. how much of me was based on how I was raised and how much was genetic or biologically inherited. Well, I'm thinking of the shift in terms of becoming aware of your own relinquishment mm -hmm. and your yeah, own it, adoption. Yeah, it, 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 it affected me. I, you know, I felt like I thought I knew who I was for 23 years. And then all of a sudden I felt like I was this totally different person that I had to get to know. And I had to get counseling and a lot of prayer and just kind of reinvent myself and create the person that I wanted to be, not who everyone else wanted me to be. It sounds like you've um, had some success with that. You know, you're I talking have. about something 30 years ago. I mean, it was a yes. long, it's been a long story, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, I've done a lot of work on myself. I definitely have. I've seen the growth. Well, what you're describing is not easy to come to terms with. When Eric Erickson, and he's one of our main theorists in terms of development, when Eric Erickson was 16 years old, he found out that his father was not his father by birth. His father was a, um, a father by adoption. What he did is he changed his name and he became Eric, the son of Eric. And so that's how he actually got his name. But he had to deal with the pain and the, the distress of learning that uh, there was a secret all along that had been kept. And so he had to deal with the, the grief and the irritation, the anger around something that occurred that was so fraudulent. Tragedy that unfortunately happened. Yeah, and then just trusting men, you know, because of I felt, you know, I, I trusted my parents and then they didn't tell me the truth. So that affected, that's affected my relationships as far as, you know, I don't want any more secrets. I want people to be honest, open, transparent. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I've just had too many secrets in my life that were kept from me. Nobody wants to be a secret. And no. for, for those of you involved with reunions, um, sometimes that's an issue because all you, your life, you have been a secret in another story. And so those, those secrets are always unfortunate. That's actually a segue to our next question. Um, so. Uh, we had a question about forgiveness and um, how you work, how you help adoptees work toward forgiveness. Um, this particular adoptee um, sought a reunion and her birth mother uh, wasn't interested and then eventually died without them having a reunion. So she doesn't have a lot of information about her birth father and um, is, is seeking to do some work around for forgiveness. I'm not sure the the story is the story of needing to forgive the birth father, or the birth mother. I think, so far as I understand it, um, for not participating. Well, maybe for both of them. But let me say a little bit about forgiveness. Um, you know, I come at it also as a pastor, so it's it's always been something I've been concerned about. Um, forgiveness is very similar to grieving. They're just like right next to each other because to really forgive, you have to face the reality of the injury that you sustained. If you deny it, make believe it's not true, then forgiveness doesn't happen. Forgiveness um, is so much like grieving there. They just cross tracks with each other all the time because forgiveness means facing the reality and the pain that comes with whatever the injury has been and then coming to coming to terms with it in such a way that you can kind of lift your boot off somebody's throat. You don't have to hold somebody um, in hostage to your anger anymore. So forgiveness is really an important part of, um, of often, often a very important part of reunions. And I think that um, in terms of, of, of noticing how important it is, when we can't forgive, we're stuck. And that turns into bitterness. And then bitterness creates distance. Um, and a lot of birth moms will say, wait a minute, I didn't have a choice here. And a lot of them are telling the truth. Um, and I want, I want birth mothers to hear that, that there's, a, there's an, under, a, a, an unfair rap that they often receive 
um, especially in the old closed system when there was so much pressure uh, to relinquish your child. Now, birth mothers are running the show. And I'm kind of thankful for that because birth moms, for the most part, make the judgment calls about where their children uh, may be uh, relinquished to. So they're in charge of that decision. But years ago, it wasn't the case. And so even if a, a birth mom is relatively innocent in, in terms of the pressure she received and the demand that was made that she relinquish, it's still a wound. Even if the birth mom cared deeply, it's still a wound for the adoptee. And that has to be forgiven. If that is, for, you know, that's, if that has to be forgiven, if that can be forgiven, then it's no longer an issue. If it's no longer an issue, then life can go on in a very different way, which is much more uh, fruitful and flourishing. People can flourish if they do the forgiveness. Sometimes it takes a long time, but it has to happen. I can't hear you. I'm sorry, thanks. Um, the next question was from um, a parent who is caring um, for two kids in kinship care. Um, they're seven and 11 years old, and it sounds like uh, maybe they're acting out, and the 11 year old is trying to be the mother of the seven year old, and the kinship caregiver is asking um, how she can work with that. A little off the topic of adoptee romantic radar, but well, we're setting it up, though, aren't we? Yeah, right. If we if we really help these children, then their love lives will be much healthier. That's kind of my point tonight. Um, a lot has to do with the age at which these children were received into adoption, and it doesn't. It sounds like is this a, maybe a foster care kind of setup or something like that? Yeah, it sounds like the caregiver is a relative. All right. So I think the kids are maybe a little older when they came in. To well, um, I, the second book I wrote called Wise Adoptive Parenting is for these parents. In other words, how can they respond to their children when their children are really struggling to attach? For whatever reason, they're, they're, there's a real compromise in attachment. And that compromise is really the kind of the core of the issue here. But in terms of working with these children, the biggest thing we can talk about is structure. Structure makes a child feel secure. Even if the child pushes against the structure, um, it's very, very important that uh, adoptive parents understand that offering structure is a way of offering security and safety to children who may have never felt very safe. And for a lot of adoptive parents in stories like this, as I said earlier, they work so very, very hard to get to the heart of their children. And sometimes it doesn't happen. And so they have to deal with the realities of compromised attachment. And sometimes these children really become very angry and they act out because they're letting everybody know how frightened they are of being, in, uh, of being vulnerable. So, um, my answer is first of all, structure and then empathy. But you know what that is. We all know what empathy is. It's like trying to understand what it's like to be seven years old and not know where your birth parents are. Um, you know, and I mean, I've, I've, worked, I've done a lot of work with teenagers who are relinquished and adopted. And sometimes parents, parents that I have worked with have transported their children against their will to different settings all over the country where they can um, become involved in a program that helps them accept, accept authority and um, rein in the anger that they've been acting out. Sometimes it gets very, very difficult, but structure and empathy are the two words that would come to mind. Uh, the next question is, um, and I'm assuming maybe this is from a significant, significant other. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to support a relinquished adoptee when that hasn't been this person's personal experience? I'm not sure I understand who's talking here. You're saying that someone wants to care for someone who's relinquished and adopted. 
Yes, yeah, so I'm assuming maybe it's a spouse or a significant other of an yeah. adoptee who's not adopted themselves, but would like to be supportive to the adoptee. Well, I think the real answer there first is that 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 supporting other needs needs to do as much education as possible, to learn as much as possible, to do some of the reading um, and that uh, that could be helpful. Um, and by the way, I forgot to say it earlier, but this whole business of adoptee romantic radar and adoption, love adoption style, Betty Jean Lifton wrote a book in 1994 called Journey of the Adopted Self. And chapter 15 is the mark of Oedipus. And that chapter lays out the theory that I have been laying out tonight. I wanna to give her credit for that. It's chapter 15, the mark of Oedipus. Back to the story. Um, how do you help somebody who doesn't want to look at something? I mean, part of it, the first step I would, would recommend, of course, is to get some reading done so you understand what are the dynamics here and why is it so difficult for this um, person to be dealing with this issue. Um, so education's first, but the second is conversation. And that's kind of like, it, you know, those relationships, the, the conversations work out the best when you start with honey, you know, honey. Help me understand why it's so hard for you to deal with this. Help me understand why, help me understand what it's like to be you is maybe my favorite question. I, if maybe for all these years, it's my favorite question. What is it like to be you? Because that opens up, that opens up the conversation that can lead to change. And you know, sometimes people face this stuff and they can't do it alone, but they are able to if they have the support of a spouse or a significant other that's right next to them. You know, in terms of search and reunion, it's one thing to do the search and reunion. It's another thing to do the homework around it. And that homework around it has to do with understanding what's happening to you and making sense of the emotional turmoil and, um, and struggles, challenges that are sometimes there. I mean, you know, a, a simple way to say all of this, nothing goes nowhere. Everything goes somewhere. And whatever's unresolved in our own personal stories is going to play out one way or another in our relationships, in general, in our relationships. Um, we can be the good adoptee who is always so good that nobody will ever get mad at her. We can be the bad adoptee who's a rascal. And so if you're a really a rascal, nobody's going to mess with you. I mean, they're both just interesting and sometimes necessary defenses against dealing with the heart of the issue. And that's where the action really is. Where is the heart of this issue? The heart of this issue has a lot to do with the capacity to be sad. Adoptive parents need to help their children be sad. And if we can accept that sadness and do that grieving and the forgiveness that comes with it, then we're freed from a burden that we don't have to live with forever. So one last question, and then we have unfortunately a few that we're not gonna have time to get to, but um, while we're talking about forgiveness, an adoptive mother asked if you feel that all adoptees need um, to be able to offer forgiveness. Is that a universal need for adoptees? I think so. I mean, if the goal is to become all that you can be, if the goal is to become the person that God wants you to be, then that forgiveness has to be in place. Because otherwise, if that forgiveness does not happen, and if someone kind of like, and, and men more than women, of course, I mean, it's very, this is very gender uh, specific. I think you all know that. Men more than women are gonna say, I'm not gonna deal with it. I mean, women do a lot more searching than men do um, because they're closer to their hearts. I mean, that's my read on society and what it's like to be male. But I think that um, there, is, there, is a, there is a way in which all of us who are wounded 
need to deal with what has hurt us so that we can come to terms with it, name it, and forgive it, and then let it be. So my answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, on that note, unfortunately, um, we've come to the it was very quick hour. Um, I could listen to you for many hours, Ron. Um, thank well, you. I just love the opportunity to do this. I got so excited, I kind of got uh, discombobulated a little, but that's okay. Well, I want to have you back to talk about um, religion and adoption, because I've heard you speak on that before, and I know you have a lot of words of wisdom on that as well. So well, we have you back. I, I'm saying this to you, Betsy, but everybody here, I'd love the conversation. Thank you. Thank you if we do it again. Thank you. We'll do that. All right. Uh, Okay, um, so um, just to wrap things up, I'm going to post the link to our calendar. We do have several other opportunities for conversation and discussion and a lot of um, support and discussion meetings where uh, particip participants get to talk as well. Um, thank you for attending this evening. And uh, we, as I think many of you know, Adoption Network Cleveland is a nonprofit support and education and advocacy organization. And we do hope that you check out our website and hopefully uh, join so that you continue to be part of the conversation. And we, we thank you all for coming. Have a good evening, everyone. Take care. Okay.